Um, I'm a little nervous, and I'm not sure why, because I, um, I, the Charter for Compassion has become such an important document to me. I thank Alex for letting me be part of this service, even though he knows I hate public speaking. <laughs> so um, good morning to everyone. Um, for the past year, I feel as though I've been on a journey with the Charter for Compassion. I heard about it from many, many sources and seemingly all at the same time, and I was so intrigued by the concept of a multi-faith, multinational, multicultural endeavor that would bring both the challenge but also the hope of harmony uh, to a world that is so, so troubled. The document uh, presents a global ethic based on that very simple concept of the golden rule, which Karen Armstrong, that dynamic entity behind the charter, has stated so many times, is at the root of all world religions, as is compassion. So as you heard, the, the public concept for the charter began in 2007 when Karen Armstrong received that TED Prize and began her her efforts to promote what, quote, Ted, Prize, Ted Prizes are intended for, an idea to make the world a better place. Some of you may have heard her presentation at last year's General Assembly, and um, you may have listened to it later on YouTube, as I did. I remember many, many comments being made at the time that there were um, many linkages between the Charter for Compassion and the seven principles of Unitarian Universalism. As a religious scholar, Armstrong certainly had privately thought about the concept for a very long time. She deeply understands many of the issues that divided the people on planet Earth from the beginning of time, and she wisely knew that for it to have power and sway, the charter had to emanate from many sources. And so she amassed um, notable members of faith communities and movements around the world who could put aside the tenets of their individual dogmas to design a document that could speak to everyone. She also sought input not just from the Desmond Tutus of the world, but also from any and all who really wanted to have input. In the spring of last year, um, last year to 2011, when Alex brought many, uh, many people from local faith communities together to begin sketching out what became our 9-11 commemoration, the Charter for Compassion was just a natural fit it had the tone and the tenor that we all wanted for that day. And along with those powerful personal stories and that magnificent music, um, the charter became an important aspect of the commemoration. We chose it to be the concluding piece because we wanted to end on a hopeful note, but we also wanted it to be a call to action for all of us to examine whether or not we live the ideals of the Charter in our own lives. The commemoration was embraced by more people in our community than I could have ever imagined. There were, by everyone's estimate, over 700 people there that day. Um, and it, its success stimulated more discussion. The Charter became the topic for the spring 2012 CACIT Lay Academy which Alex spearheaded, and at the same time, Alex also began a 10-part discussion course for a small group of us on Karen Armstrong's book, 12 Steps to a More Compassionate Life. I learned so much, um, and I will be forever in their debt, from the people with whom I interacted during the year or so since I first read the Charter for Compassion. If I had been asked a few years ago what I thought compassion was, or whether or not I thought of myself as a compassionate person, I would have been able to come up with a reasonable definition, and I probably would have said, well, sh sure, I, I, think I'm, I think of myself as being a comp compassionate person. But I never really thought about compassion in a conscious way, beyond the obvious of 
being nice most of the time, <laughs> providing a helping hand to people in our community, or having an appreciation for how acceptance of people on a global level could help promote peace around the world. While these are important, they're also a bit abstract in terms of what type of person I really want to be or who I really am. And in my understanding now, for me, the most important part of compassion is how I live my life every day when I interact with my family, my friends, my colleagues, the students in my classes, the women who clean the building that I work in, the fellow that puts up the produce at Bilo. I, the list can go on and on, but we think about the many hundreds of people that you interact with in a very casual way every day of your life. Maybe not hundreds every day of your life, many. So how do I interact with people? Not when I'm in good form, but when I'm overworked or stressed or sad or any, any number of the gloomy emotions that we all deal with day to day. I realize that I have such a very long way to go before I can emphatically respond yes to whether or not I think of myself as a compassionate person. I was certainly never consciously rude, but I also was not always conscious of, of when my congenital impatience <laughs> resulted in me being somewhat terse or short with family or people I don't know very well or people I don't know at all or when I was inattentive to someone who was having a worse time of it than I could ever, ever hope to understand. So what have I learned from my journey toward compassion? Uh, the biggest change for me is being more conscious every day of how my words sound, how they impact another person, and how my actions really do speak louder than those words. I slip regularly. I struggle to be less impatient. It, it is, it is, um, it is a, a challenge for me to not be impatient. But I also feel that it's less of a struggle than it was before. I'm conscious of my perspective and my psyche being more at peace, less harried, and more hopeful. I've also tried to learn compassion for myself, especially when I'm a lesser person than I want to be. That alone has, has made me, thankfully, less judgmental. When I can remember my flaws are only human, I can also remember that someone else's flaws are only human and that no one is all good or all bad. Now, many of you who are more highly evolved than I am must be thinking that none of this is astounding or revolutionary, and, and of course it isn't. But the con conscious shift in my thoughts, words, and actions has been something of a transformation for me. There are points in most people's lives when they can look back and identify major emotional and intellectual growth spurts. I would say that this has been, been one of those spurts for me. I'm indebted to Alex for the role he played in having the Charter for Compassion be my companion over the past year. I'm indebted to all of the people who made me truly think about what that means. And, and I'm absolutely sure that when the, the Dalai Lama spoke the words that are written in your bulletin today, that he was speaking directly to me when he said, if you want others to be happy, practice compassion. If you want to be happy, practice compassion. I've always liked that quote, quote, but it really has a much deeper meaning to me now than it, than it ever has. So of course, offering a helping hand to people in our community or accepting differences among people on a global level will help promote peace in the world. But I firmly believe that it is the small changes and shifts we make as individuals to consciously create a web of caring interactions that will be the real path to peace in the world. I want to close by saying that the relational covenant that our fellowship will be considering is a logical step toward a more compassionate community for all of us. 
it's based on our unison affirmation. It, it is a way of keeping us conscious, and I think that's the key to compassion, is being conscious of, of that interaction that you have. But it'll help keep us conscious of our commitment to be respectful, accepting, and compassionate. And again, it's all very logical, and it speaks to our seven principles. So um, it's not rocket science either. But the trick, the, the true trick of giving it power and force is to keep that covenant as a conscious part of our fellowship life. The Charter for Compassion is a brilliantly crafted, non-denominational document that speaks volumes, and it speaks volumes through its very simple elegance. The, the simplicity of that document, I think, is what is so astounding about it. Our relational covenant will be a beautifully written piece based on the affirmation that we recite, most of us by heart, every Sunday together. But they are just feel-good words to me if I don't consciously incorporate their spirit and intent into my daily life, even though I will sometimes fail as time goes by. If I aim to, I will fail less, less often. And um, we, some of us went to a workshop yesterday that on, on um, um, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, on conflict resolution, and um, one of the one of the people there made a comment that just because it's Sunday and you're at church, it doesn't mean Jesus is is in the room. <laughs> and I think that that is that is wholly what the Charter for Compassion is about: is to keep that a conscious part of your daily life and how you interact with people. So. Thank you for letting me be part of this service.